One of the beauties of the Bible beyond its disclosure of the plan of God is that it enables us to learn of the many locations that various events took place, some of which we may have even been blessed to visit. You are already aware of such places, Greece, Dalmatia, or modern day Croatia, Italy, Spain, and of course, Israel with its different regions and cities. The historical and prophetic lessons respecting these nations and those whose activities were centrally located in these areas are familiar to us. However, our plan during this convention is to consider a different region of the world, which the scriptures also detail quite a bit. This would be some of the nations within the continent of Africa, along with its people and the lessons the Lord may wish for us to draw from them. The period of time that we plan to cover spans almost 4,500 years, which is impossible for us to address in a 45 minute discourse. Because there's much that we wish to share on this subject, we'll do our best to offer our thoughts during this convention through two presentations. The first part will be addressed now and we'll touch upon certain territories within Africa, along with its people during the period recorded in the Old Testament, commencing mostly after the flood. The second portion, Lord willing, will be presented at the start of tomorrow's convention and we'll address some of the lessons we can draw from the New Testament, the harvest message, and some secular history. Now, perhaps you may think, and why is Brother Brian giving discourses that are focused on Africa and its people, particularly when considering these two points? Number one, all the Lord's people have experiences, particularly challenging ones. Otherwise, we would have nothing to overcome in order to obtain the divine life. And two, the words of Acts 1034, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. If these thoughts came to your mind, I can share a few things that had me make this decision. Some years ago, my daughter Karen went online to ancestry.com, which as you may know, is a website that claims to be the world's largest collection of online family history records. What they promote is that if any wish to know a bit more about their historical roots, Ancestry.com directs such individuals to send them a sample of their DNA through a saliva test. And through that, they will provide one's ethnicity estimates. Now, while I have not had such a test performed on myself, Karen did, so I will claim her results as my own, which are as follows. And as you can see, the estimates come from Cameroon, Congo, uh, Southern Bantu peoples, Benin and Togo, Ivory Coast and Ghana, Mali, Ireland and Scotland, and England and Wales. Now, even without this test, some of the cited countries do not surprise me, but are more broadly supportive of what Genesis 9.19 tells us and will soon explicitly read that we each have traceable roots which come from different corners of the globe. But since I have some significantly discernible African roots and have developed some special relationships with many of the brethren from this continent, that got me into thinking about doing a presentation like this. Here's the other thing which actually was the greatest motivating factor for these presentations. While the documented history of Africans throughout the globe has been extensive, in our world today, there appears to be a heightened awareness in different respects of events involving those whose roots come from the African continent combined with the experiences unique to this demographic. And that awareness is not limited to those in the world, but also from the communications I have recently read and heard among the Lord's people including the role that such ones may play in God's plan of salvation. According to Matthew 23, 8, the master says, all ye are brethren. Thus as brethren, there should be a mutual comfort that we have in discussing any matter, so long as we use the scriptures for course direction. The apostle Paul reminds us of this in 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness. Therefore, since the scriptures do provide us with lessons about some of the nations in Africa and those prominent figures which hail from them, just as we reflect upon other countries from the scriptures and the personalities who spent much time in these nations, our plan is to consider how the lessons we gain from Africa and its people are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. One other point that we think is important to emphasize, admittedly, there have been brethren over the years that have selectively touched upon certain places and personalities from Africa with lessons that we have been blessed by. So we do not wish to suggest that this hasn't been the case up to now. However, our plan during this convention is to try to more comprehensively address as many all Africa themes as time will permit. That is our hope, trusting that we receive the Lord's blessing in all matters presented. Before looking at a portion of the scriptural record, we want to share some information and estimates about Africa. There are over 1,275,000,000 residents, the second most populated continent in the world. It's made up of 54 countries. Nigeria on the west coast of the continent is the most populated country in Africa with 206 million people, the seventh most populous country in the world behind China, India, the United States, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Brazil. Seychelles is the least populous country in Africa with 97,000 residents. Algeria is the largest country area-wise with almost 920,000 square miles. And in addition to having the smallest population, Seychelles located approximately 130 miles off the coast of East Africa is made up of 115 islands, which collectively makes up 177 square miles. Like most continents, the countries within Africa include different dominant racial groups. These can also be subdivided into multiple subgroups, which is an important point since the individuals within these subgroups do not view themselves as a monolithic people when compared to other Africans insofar as looks, culture, language, and social status even when some outside of Africa may view them that way. Some other numbers. There are roughly 4.5 million Caucasians that live in Africa, but mostly in South Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Namibia. Among those in the Mongolian race are Asians in which 3 million are scattered throughout many African countries. It is also estimated that some 50 million indigenous Berbers live in most of the North African countries such as Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Mali, and Egypt. However, the largest racial group of people from the African continent is the Negroid race, perhaps in excess of 1.2 billion. Thus, most of our remarks will be focused on this demographic. So let's now look at the scriptures beginning with the Genesis account. The first dispensation of man's history describes a time when God saw the wickedness of humanity being great, corrupt and full of violence, which caused him to permit a flood to rid the earth of all that dwelleth therein, except Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Genesis 5:32 gives us the names of Noah's sons. The verse reads as follows. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Here's what Genesis 9.19 tells us from the New American Standard. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So beyond each of us being a descendant of Noah and his sons, which even Ancestry.com does not consider, we also know that however distant it may be, all mankind, including each of us, are related in the flesh. Now, when the ark settled in the mountains of Ararat post the flood, 
historians suggest that would have been somewhere in the Turkish mountains. If we accept this as being correct, it's believed that Noah and his sons and grandsons would have ultimately migrated from this general area to the regions which surround it, but where? In the case of Japheth, who had seven sons, Genesis 10, two to four gives his genealogy. And in verse five, we read the following. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in the lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Thus we would suggest that Japheth's descendants initially occupied the isles of the Gentiles, a territory that we think describes the coastlands of the Mediterranean Sea, namely through Europe and Asia Minor. But after this, they sojourned north throughout Europe and into parts of Asia. Therefore, we would suggest that the earliest expansion of the Negroid race was not throughout Europe and Asia. Next, while we find the genealogy of Shem in Genesis 10, 21 to 30, we will read verses 21 and 22. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. Now, some Bible scholars associate Shem's children with the following locations. Elam with Persia, Asher with Assyria, Arphaxad with Chaldea, Lud with Lydia, and Aram with Syria. As these are all regions of the Middle East, we don't see the earliest expansion of the Negroid race throughout these territories either. The last son of Noah to examine is Ham. According to Strong's 2526, Ham derives from the Hebrew word quam, which means hot, as in one coming from a tropical habitat, as some have suggested, sunburned or black. The genealogy of Ham is recorded in Genesis 10, six to 20. And from that account, we know that he had four sons, Cush, Mizraim, Fat, and Canaan, who was the youngest son. With the exception of Canaan, the other three are believed to have founded certain African nations. In the case of Cush, it was the Sudan and later Ethiopia. In the case of Mizraim, it was Egypt, as Mizraim is the Hebrew and Aramaic name for that land. And in the case of Fat, it was Libya. Now, as to Canaan's descendants, we would suggest that they ultimately settled in the land of Canaan, where they established their own individualized communities. We know that God wanted the Israelites to occupy this land, a territory that was not a part of Africa. Caleb was one of the 12 who were sent into Canaan to spy out the land and report back to Moses and the Israelites about the possibilities of entering and possessing it. Ten of the spies advised against this, but Joshua and Caleb recommended with full confidence in the Lord to enter the land and drive out its enemies, the Canaanites. Forty years later, the Israelites did under the leadership of Joshua, but whether Israelites or Canaanites, the color of both was likely similar, but presumed to be distinctly different from the descendants of Cush, Muzrain, and Fat that migrated to Africa with complexions described as those coming from a tropical habitat, sunburned or black. We raise these complexion distinctions as they form the basis in what some associate as being part of the curse that Noah asserts in Genesis 9. You know, Bible students generally disagree with Christendom with what we would characterize as essential doctrines but interestingly, the curse asserted by Noah in Genesis 9 is not only viewed differently from Bible student to Bible student and those within Christendom, but some Bible students actually agree with some in Christendom on how this curse should be understood. Therefore, we find it to be worthy to touch upon this subject. There is a view which purports that the family of Ham representing the Negroid race is a cursed people. 
our understanding on why some hold this view begins with Genesis 9, verses 20 to 25, which we will read as follows. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren. So these texts seem to be clear that Noah farmed and drank the wine from grapes. However, if we were to look back to Genesis 7, there we're reminded that the canopy of the earth opened and collapsed at the outset of the flood, which changed the temperature of the earth and thus caused the grapes from Noah's vineyard to become fermented or more specifically alcoholic in nature. Now, while Noah may not have known of the effects that the wine would have on him before becoming intoxicated, verse 22 tells us that Ham saw Noah's nakedness and told his brothers who covered him. So when Noah awoke from his intoxicated state, he stated he knew what his younger son did. Now, what would that be? Well, there are some that suggest that Ham committed a homosexual act on Noah. And because of this, Noah, as God's prophet, cursed Ham's unborn son, Canaan. The one we would add did not migrate to Africa. Yet, these same ones suggest that the curse from this purported homosexual act passed on to all the Negroid race by virtue of those of this race not having fair skin and straight hair but dark skin, coarse hair, and harsh experiences in life supposedly unique to the Negroid race. Some give as an example that these disadvantages were highlighted during slavery in the United States, but historical records reflect that this system of servitude was also widespread within the African continent before then in the forms of debt slavery, enslavement of war captives, military slavery, slavery for prostitution and criminal slavery. With the United States slavery beginning over 400 years ago, many would say that it's associated with ongoing systemic problems against the African race in the US and elsewhere, which includes limited educational opportunities, being disadvantaged before civil governments, social despair, economic hardships, and violent attacks, including lynchings, mostly from the past, to other forms of brutality widely reported and seen on video today. We take a different view. Let's return back to Genesis 9:22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Therefore, it is because Ham saw the nakedness of his father that Noah decided to curse Canaan. What exactly does this word saw mean in this context? The word saw comes from the strong 7200, which is the Hebrew word ra'o, which means to see literally or figuratively, to perceive, watch, or look upon. Also, the word saw can be found in the scriptures over 534 times, and in no instance does the word saw connote a perverted or homosexual act. Rather, we are more persuaded to conclude what many commentators have, namely that Ham mocked his father with laughter upon seeing Noah naked, something that his brothers did not do. Therefore, we would suggest that the curse of Canaan, who was not a part of the Negroid race to migrate to Africa, would not appear to fit into the thought of how the black race through Ham's three other sons was supposedly cursed through Noah's proclamation. Now, some of you may have read the expanded biblical comments for Genesis 9.25, which says, cursed be Canaan, where we find the term cursed, which says possible start of Negro race, 
citing reprint 2344-6 as a reference. Three points. Number one, the statement in the expanded biblical comic book, Possible Start of a Negro Race, is not recorded in reprint 2344. Two, reprint 2344 is titled Interesting Questions Answered. And the pastor's actual comment was in reply to a question on if there is anything to claim of a pre-Adamic race. In his answer, one of the things the pastor says is that the scriptures are positive in the declaration that Adam was the first human being. Three, the pastor's actual quote on the Negro in this same question is, the Negro race is supposed to be descended from Ham. With the term supposed meaning generally assumed or believed to be the case, but not necessarily so. Thus, we would suggest that all of the Negro race was not passed from Ham to each of his four sons. What we think we can reasonably conclude about the curse of Canaan comes from our understanding of the book of Joshua, chapters 11 and 12. There we find that the descendants of Canaan, who again are a heterogeneous assembly of tribes known as Canaanites, are included in a list of nations to be exterminated. The destruction began by the Philistines and was later completed by the Israelites, hence the curse. While these are our views, some of you may conclude differently. If so, we would be happy to hear your comments about this. So we'd like to move on now and next comment on two African con countries predominantly mentioned in the scriptures. One is Ethiopia, which along with Ethiopian is referenced in 40 Old Testament scriptures. The other is Egypt mentioned 611 times in 558 verses. Before looking to the scriptures, let's look at some statistics. Egypt is reported as having just over 101 million residents. It's the second most populous country in Africa and the 14th most populous country in the world. For our scriptural references and lessons about Egypt in the Old Testament, we will consider four. One, we have God's call to Abraham to leave Haran and his relatives to go to a land, Canaan, where his many descendants would become a great nation. Upon his arrival, the Canaanites were residing there, but Abraham built an altar to the Lord after being informed that this was the land that he would give him. Thereafter, Abraham moved a bit farther south, place to place to take camp, but there was such a famine in Canaan that he had to go even farther south. Where to? It was Egypt, a safe place for him, Sarah, and Lot, who were traveling with him to dwell. Two, for our second scriptural reference to Egypt, we look to Joseph, a type of our Lord, who was sold by his brothers and taken to Egypt. But through God's help, he was later released from prison and made ruler over all Egypt, the most powerful person in the land next to Pharaoh. Then after Canaan was struck with a famine with no food, supplies in reserve, Joseph brought his Jewish brothers to Egypt where they could be cared for even though they had mistreated him years earlier by selling him as a slave prior to his exaltation to power. Three, we now move to our third scriptural reference which comes after the death of Joseph when a new king arose to oppress the Israelites, hold them in bondage, and sought to exterminate all male children by having them cast into a river. Through God's providence, a special baby that was placed in a little ark and left in the river was saved, not just by a random Egyptian, but by the daughter of the king and ultimately being protected by the Egyptian government. Of course, and we have since come to know that little boy as Moses, also a type of Christ. Number four, for our last scripture, scriptural reference and perhaps the best encouragement that we get from Egypt today relates to a visually present landmark of many years. It is not only meaningful to us, but admired by the world. It is of course the Great Pyramid. Many of us have concluded that the Great Pyramid is identified in Isaiah 19, 19 to 20. So let's read those verses. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt 
and a pillar at the border thereof to, to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Like with most prophecies, we may see the details differently, but I believe there is support to conclude that when Isaiah wrote this, he was referring to a future time. Let's offer our suggested views concerning its prophetic meaning, keen on some specific terms within these verses. Altar. Altars make us think of sacrifices. And in the grotto of the pyramid, the death of Jesus is pictured, his ransom sacrifice for the world. Myths. The altar is described as being in the midst or middle of the land of Egypt. Simply stated, if we were to draw a line, a latitude meridian, through the area of earth where there is the most land mass, it would run right through the area where Egypt and specifically the Great Pyramid lies. Pillar. The term comes from Strong 4676, which is the Hebrew word matseba, which means something stationed a memorial stone, a standing image. In other words, something unmovable. You know, the Great Pyramid is considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It is the oldest, and the other six wonders that followed it are long gone, yet while certainly worn over the years, it continues to stand to this very day as an unmovable image through the permission of our Heavenly Father. Border. If we go back to the times of ancient Egypt, it was divided with the northern portion belonging to the kingdom of lower Egypt and the southern portion belonging to the kingdom of upper Egypt. So the border between both kingdoms shows how the great pyramid of Giza could be at the border, which by the way, Giza means border in the Egyptian language. Sign is a symbol or a mark which describes something worth beholding. And that which is worth beholding is our Lord, his sacrifice, and what it will mean to the world. But we now have the privilege of now appreciating the sign of the pyramid and what it means to us and soon the world. Witness. Finally, the Great Pyramid in Egypt, North Africa, is something that we are prepared to witness about to any hearing ear. The world may not care about this witness in the midst of Africa, beyond its touristic appreciation among other pyramids, camel rides and souvenir sales, but it will soon speak to mankind when the time comes for the plan of God to be revealed to them through their recognition of the chief cornerstone, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's now consider the other prominently named African country in the Old Testament, and that is Ethiopia, the third most populous nation on the continent and the 15th in the entire world with just shy of 100 million, 101 million people. Like with Egypt, for our scriptural references and lessons about Ethiopia in the Old Testament, we will also consider four. For our first example, at the age of 40, when Moses was forced to flee from Egypt, he ended up as a refugee in the land of Midian in the Northwest Arabian Peninsula. While there and through his kindness in assisting the daughters of Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses was not only taken into his home, but later married one of his daughters named Zipporah. In Numbers 12, one we read, and Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Yes, Moses, a Jew, and probably the greatest Old Testament prophet married an Ethiopian woman, an interracial marriage, as it were, despite his brother and sister criticizing him for it. But this came at a price to Miriam, through her jealousy of Zipporah. Numbers 12, 11 to 16 identifies God's punishment against her, namely resulting in Miriam turning white with leprosy until she mended her ways. One of the things about, one other thing about Zipporah, while she was apparently not born a Jew, she came to understand the importance of circumcision. In Exodus 4, 24 to 26, we understand that God was prepared to kill Moses for neglecting the right of circumcision of his son. But it was Zipporah, an Ethiopian, that averted this calamity by reacting quickly 
in performing this rite, thus saving her Jewish husband. For our second scriptural example, we can inform you that tomorrow we hope to address a eunuch from Ethiopia identified in the eighth chapter of Acts, but now I wish to comment on a different eunuch, one not spoken of as much we find in Jeremiah 38 and 39. His name is Abimelech, who was an official and servant of King Zedekiah in his palace. Abimelech had trust in God, which is evidenced by his plea to the king on behalf of Jeremiah, who declared the Lord's message for the Jews to flee Jerusalem. However, the nation assumed Jeremiah was siding with his enemies, hence they wanted Jeremiah put to death. The king yielded, and even though the prophet was not killed right away, he was lowered into a dungeon left to die. Left to die. When Abimelech found out about this, he petitioned the king, causing him to instruct the Ethiopian to secure 30 men to release Jeremiah from the dungeon. Beyond this rescue, perhaps the most impactful lesson from this story is that it shows how Abimelech, as an Ethiopian and eunuch, demonstrated more faith in God through his bravery than the nation of Israel, including Zedekiah. Hence, God protected him during the capture of the city. Whether Abimelech qualifies as one of the unnamed heroes of faith from Hebrews 11 is unclear, but we are reasonably certain that our Heavenly Father permitted his story to be recorded for our edification as a person of much faith. Number three, according to the Septuagint, Jeremiah references ancient Africa and Africans 53 times, thus suggesting that he was very familiar with both, as we have already seen with Abimelech. For our third scriptural example, we get strong evidence of the prophet's familiarity with Africans through the text found in Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Jeremiah's question may suggest that Israel could not change the proclamation that he made concerning their soon coming trouble unless God saw reason to intervene due to a change in their heart. Thus the significance that an Ethiopian or specifically a black person could not change their skin color, which is generally true. Interestingly, in the February 15th, 1904 Watchtower reprint 3320 titled, Can the Ethiopian Change His Skin? The pastor suggests what the Ethiopian could not do for himself, God could do for him. In the same reprint, the pastor comments that in September 1901, a nine-year-old black boy turned nine-tenths white with which a doctor concurred without that person having a disease. However, there are other current day examples of this as this photo depicts. So perhaps this is not an exclusive anomaly. Similarly, there are examples of this occurring the other way around as shown by this Caucasian general, gentleman developing a dark skin color. So these type of changes are not unusual and potentially could happen to any of us. For our fourth and final scriptural example regarding Ethia to which we will close with for what sometimes can be the experience of many Africans, particularly in the flesh. We look to 2 Samuel 18, 19 to 32. We won't read the account, but it relates to an order that David's nephew and the commander of his army, Joab, gave to his servant, an Ethiopian, to inform David that his son, Absalom, was killed. As we know from the account, Joab played a pivotal role as the commander of David's forces during Absalom's rebellion when he rallied much of Israel against David, who was forced to flee with only his most trusted men. David could not bring himself to harm his son and ordered his men not to harm Absalom. However, during the battle that followed, Absalom got his hair caught while on a mule in some tree branches, and what followed was Joab and his men killing Absalom. Not wanting to be one to pass on this information to David, Joab instructed the Ethiopian to tell David what he saw, which we take to mean that Absalom was killed. Now, while Joab is not among us to ask why he did this, perhaps he assumed that by sending a person of low rank or color would be understood to be a sign of bad news versus 
one not of color and of higher rank, would be the bearer of good news. Interestingly, Ahimeaz, son of the high priest Zadok, who succeeded him in that role, insisted to Joab that he wanted to be the one to tell David of the victory in battle, apparently believing that David would present gifts to him after delivering the good news that his men won in battle. Joab opined otherwise, but ultimately consented in letting him go. This made Ahimeaz run down the road, right past the Ethiopian, to greet David first and inform him of the victory. However, David was less concerned about this and wanted to know of the welfare of Absalom. Once Ahimeaz denied knowing what happened, David told him to step aside so that the Ethiopian could speak. After he broke the news of Absalom's death, this caused David to be overcome with grief. Some might suggest that Joab's possible views of the Ethiopian provides a parallel to what many of black African descent during the gospel age claim to experience, that as a people, such ones are generally not perceived as bringing things that are good value. But since our time is now gone, we will save our remarks for more about the gospel age tomorrow during part two of our presentation on the lessons we get from Africa and its people during the gospel age based upon the record in the New Testament, the harvest message, and those portions of secular history that we will look to consider. We ask the Lord's forgiveness for anything said that was not pleasing in his sight and ask that he be with us and bless us during the remainder of this convention. Amen.